You're all very welcome to our latest Innovate Ireland Meetup. Um, firstly, I'm obliged to inform you that we're recording the event for our YouTube channel. Uh, so we'll proceed on the basis of on the working assumption that that's OK with everybody. Uh, I hope that's the case. Uh, for those of you that are new to Innovate Ireland, the format of this is really simple. Uh, we'll hear from one of the members for about 20 minutes or so. Um, we'll take about the same time again for open discussion and Q&A. And we'll finish up about 1.45, 1.50, although we never quite achieved that, uh, to give everybody a short break before any kind of two o'clock meetings. So last time we looked at micro-innovation, an approach for generating bite-sized ideas to solve today's business problems. And before that, we looked at ways to validate ideas. So when we've only got one or two ideas to manage, things are really easy. Um, but once we start to generate and validate more and more ideas, and another one, and another one, and another one, things, things can very quickly get out of hand. And it's all too simple to be overwhelmed and lose track of where an idea is or, or what needs to be done to it next. So how can we look, how can we keep track of all of those ideas? What kind of challenges are we going to face when we're doing that? And how best can we overcome those challenges? And basically, what are our options for, for idea management? Fortunately for us, uh, we have an expert on hand and Owen Flavin is something of an expert in this field. So Owen is the head of the innovation practice at Stepstone Consulting. Um, he's got over 20 years of experience developing international standards, including standards for innovation and idea management. And he also happens to be a member of the Innovate Ireland steering group. So Owen, looking forward to hearing what you're going to cover today. Um, so I'll hand over to you now. Thanks very much, Charlie. Welcome, everybody. And uh, we'll see how this technology part goes. And once we've nailed the technology part, I'm sure the rest of it will be smooth sin. So can we all see what we're supposed to be able to see? Excellent. OK, so Charlie said we do this regularly. True. We said about uh, that it's about discussion, not just about delivery of information. And definitely for the last session, the conversation was fantastic. Um, well, I'm hoping for some of the same, but it is slightly different. Some of what I'm doing today is a little bit of news and a little bit of teasing. So I don't think there's a huge amount of answers in what we're looking at today. But there are some hints and there are some directions, so I hope it's valuable up front. And I know there's a couple of challenges and opportunities for us as a network and us as innovation professionals, advocates and explorers, Charlie, in thinking of our value proposition. Um, so the title for today, Idea Management, Stories from the Trenches and a Platform for the Future. And that's relating to the ISO standards that uh, Charlie alluded to. That standard, of course, is only half finished. So uh, I'd love to have discussion about it today. I'd love to see what people's thoughts are about what it should be or what people are worried about with an idea management standard. And that'll be really valuable for the two or three of us who are involved in editing that standard. So there's selfish stuff going on here as well, as is always the case. What do we mean with idea management? Well, I use the phrase the fuzzy front end. And even though we're talking among, among a bunch of professionals, some people were very familiar with the phrase and others weren't. So when that was said to me, I was surprised because I heard that, I think, about eight years ago and thought it was something that everybody knew. But that's not the case. And that's kind of the point about our innovation profession. It is a profession that deserves the name, but relative to other professions, it's a little bit new. And we need to get that landscape, the framework, the language. We need to get that settled. That's part of the value of ISO standards. So when we talk about the fuzzy front end of innovation, we mean the squiggly bit. We mean the more uncertain bit. We mean the start of the funnel, it's why there's lots going on. Maybe there's thousands of ideas or prospects or opportunities or areas of opportunity. And what earth do we have to do to get those to a point where we can implement something and get some value from it? So that's what the fuzzy front is. That's what idea management is the front end of innovation, or at least that's one lens we can use when we're asking ourselves, what do we mean? I know in the introduction for, in the post for this event, Charlie also highlighted the idea of bunny rabbits and John Steinbeck. That was a pretty neat connection, Charlie. Thank, thanks for that. Okay, something else about idea management. It's not always the same thing. Uh, this information, this slide is derived from the work of uh, George Day in Horton, University of Pennsylvania. And he talks about idea failure rates. What kind of ideas are out there? What ideas are likely to succeed? 
And the key thing for us is we don't treat them all the same way. Idea management doesn't necessarily mean the same thing for all these contexts. So what kind of stuff is going to fail? But what's going to fail at a high rate? Well, the, bluntly, the less familiar, the less you know about it now, the less similar what you're looking at is to what you're doing now, whether in technology terms, that's the, the left hand, the upright axis, or in market terms, the ecosystem systems that we work on, whether they're public, private, cash, societal impact, doesn't matter. The weirder it is, the most likely or the more likely the ideas that we're looking at are to fail. What do we do about that? Well, the answer is that we treat our ideas very, very differently. If we talk about that 90% failure rate, you could think of that as really high uncertainty stuff. Horizon three to use one particular language. What are we looking for? Well, I put it to you, maybe what we're looking for is insight understanding learning itself is the objective of playing with those ideas i'm sure there's more to it but it's a proposition for you for today and a proposition is what we're talking about in terms of idea man idea management what's the end result what's the start and the, and the end of idea management now that's something we can talk about as well today and it's another area the iso standard will help us fix a viewpoint on so do you treat moonshots the same as you do a tweak to your service? Do you treat technology projects as the same risk as new product, new service, new platform offerings? Or indeed the business models that we use to change how we deliver or in the commercial world, sometimes if we're lucky, get paid for. Those are the kind of questions that we're setting out to answer uh, when we when we put together a model or for today, a standard relating to idea management. By the way, if you look at the tech and the market uh, axes, they're not the same. Looks like the market stuff is riskier. Looks like they fail more often. And this is one of the key explainers, if you like, of why people who are good at technological innovation grow faster. However, people who are really good at figuring out what their customers, their users, their stakeholders need rather than the global market around them. They're the ones who get the quicker return, the higher return in whatever terms they have locally for the innovations that they manage to bring to, to bear. So what does that mean in real life? George S. Day is a professor of innovation. He knows a lot, but is he out in the field? Well, don't know. But what I can do is share a few stories from the 20 or so years that I've been doing innovation as part of my work, as part of what I do, part of my profession. Hopefully these will shed some light on the differences that, that are included in idea management, and we should be thinking about what some of the common elements are as well. So story one that I was involved in is a really simple story. The, the question was, how can the business that I worked for at the time grow? And they put the challenge really clearly. We want to grow in one particular sector. Because we're already there, but we're not doing this thing for our existing customers. So we can grow fast and we can grow cheap and we can and we can make money. Yeah, except the customers don't buy this stuff from us. We don't mean anything. We're not credible. So how on earth do we do that? Well, we effectively only had one idea. And the idea is we needed something to hang on to. We needed some coattails. And from watching the Late Late Show and from awareness of the technology out there at the time, we came up with the idea of selling the Dyson hand dryer to washrooms, which doesn't sound radical to the outside world, but for a service company that hadn't a notion in its head of doing innovation. This idea, in my opinion, was fantastic and would fail. But we did, we represented it, and we got one sponsor, the director of sales. He loved the idea. And the part that he liked was it didn't cannibalize the existing range. Therefore, in his mind, we had permission to do this, permission to fail. So with one person's support and the story that whether they succeeded or failed, it wouldn't hurt the rest of the business. By stealth, we were allowed to do this thing that 
we had no hope in hell. If you were putting bets, there would have been no money put down for this. And by the way, it worked. The company bought a thousand of them 15 years ago. Typically, they spent about a thousand euros buying the things, the Dyson Airblades models one, two, three, and four. And typically, they rented them rather than selling them. And at least 300 of the first thousand bought in 2006 are still on the walls of their customers. And they're earning money. That sounds like a success. Except that the poor sales manager who brought this project in with me, he didn't last more than six months. He got no credit for this. And everybody else in the organization, finance, operations, thought this was a crazy idea. Why would you buy something for a thousand euro when you can buy a, a warm air dryer for a hundred quid or paper dispensers for much less? So this success had no parents. Nobody wanted to own it. And I left it behind. Valuable experience, simple innovation context, but idea management, we thought we were doing well. We were confident it worked, but we failed in the end. Nice story. Second story, much more recent, and it's 2019, 2020. In the Irish Public Service, an organization trying to renew its statement of strategy. They wanted to be innovative. They wanted to be innovative in how they do their strategy. So it a really clear challenge. We were asked to ideate. We were asked to involve and engage everybody who worked in the organization, 150 people. So we did, and within a month, we got 500 ideas with 1,300 builds, comments, uh, um, su suggestions, uh, clustering, analysis, uh, refine, stretching, and we reduced that down to five themes within the month. Those five themes were handed over to the board, and they were integrated into the strategy in a visible way. Now. That didn't produce a new business model. It didn't produce a new policy. It didn't produce a new product or service for the that Irish public service. But it engaged the entire organization in an ideation campaign, showed them how, how they could work, got great results. They loved it. And then COVID started. No continuity, no cadence, no momentum no follow through. But they have invited us back for the second half of this year. So I would hope that we get to pick up this story. Shows what can be done. For me, that was a huge confidence booster in using technology and in using the models of, of idea management that I'd come to learn since about 2013. Third story. This story is not about me. This story, uh, at the time I did the slide, I didn't have permission, but I do now. This is about Rob Reynolds, who's a member of our community. It's about Elba uh, Valley Medical, which is a, an R&D vehicle and a company that he and others set up to develop, do the R&D, and then to get investment at the various stages to make these therapies and to market these therapies. Now, he doesn't care whether his company makes or markets so long as they are part of the solution. So the purpose of Elba Valley is to develop R&D to the point where it can be brought to, the, brought to market and to bring investors on board so that it can be done. They've got some amazing, creative, very talented people. If you look at the bottom of the picture, it's a bit small, but it's the best one I could find. You've got a little nano robot, robot that when it gets into a blood vessel close enough to the problem, in this case, a great big tumor, it stops that blood vessel, no blood gets by. It starves the tumor or whatever other problem we have. And you end up with a much cheaper therapy than chemotherapy. So it's a huge investment. It's a huge R&D situation. But will it be acceptable to patients, to health, to insurers, uh, to departments of health or health providers? Is it investable? Is it scalable? What would it take to get that idea over the line? Well, I don't know. I do know that that particular company has succeeded in getting at least 10 million in the last round of investment. So they're having some success. But I think it's a really good case of moonshot, high uncertainty, 
for the world and high uncertainty for any invest in, investors and at least up until recently high uncertainty for the people doing the work. So it definitely belongs in that potentially 90% fail bracket we saw in the George Day slide. So those situations are not really the same. Sometimes what you need is creativity. In preparing today's presentation, uh, a gentleman called Vilho Johnson recommended I look at a video by uh, John Cleese, which I have provided a link to at the end of today's slides. In some cases, you really just need a bit of bravery to get out of the pool or the pond or the dish that you're in. Then you need a whole lot of stamina. And maybe you're doing testing and maybe pitching is crucial. Your ability to convince others repeatedly. Other times, what you really need is bloody mindedness to filter and kill what you don't have the resources to pursue. Now, each of these cases were touched on by the last two sessions we had in Innovate Island. So we're covering some of the same ground. But what we're really wondering today is how do you stitch these all together? Okay. So when we're finished, if you've got questions on the individual stories, fantastic. And there's a couple of questions I've got for the group today and for later that would be lovely to have a chat about. But what I'd ask for yourself is just be sure in your own mind. We have three stories and we got three approaches. Are you clear in your own head? Can you map one to the other? Which story would really need most creativity? Where is bravery and stamina most necessary? So these are not intended as mysteries, by the way. They're not that difficult. It's just to get the blood flowing and thinking. And so that we're presenting a landing strip or preparing a landing strip for what is it that, should, that an idea management standard should do for all of us, for our profession, for, our, for innovation professionals. So let's look at that then. If we consider news from the ISO trenches, there is a standard, or there will be, specifically for idea management. Now, luckily, as Charlie said, some of us in this group, not just me, are involved in standards development. So in our network, we'll have the chance to stay abreast of this news and to contribute early and to be ready to jump on board ahead of others. Nice position to be in. Let's keep it that way. Let's maximize that opportunity. There's a 57 month project. We're two thirds of the way through nominally. I think it'll be a bit delayed, but I do expect we will get it published within two years from today. So we just watch out for that when it comes. So what does it look like with two years to go? Well, there's, there's a, a really interesting question. This young gentleman is Bill the Cat. He's from Bloom County cartoon strip from the 1980s that I remember fondly. Bill's not pretty, but he doesn't have COVID. He might give you fleas. Uh, and really, there's there's nothing that a good shampoo, and, shampoo and, some, and a brush won't sort out. Not ready for his debutante ball yet, but we can get him there. That's kind of silly, but I think it's a reasonable description of where we are with the standard. We have a, we have a good design of what we would like it to be, and we've got some really good contributions uh, for the for the content, and I can tell you about some of that today. But it does need a good bit of polishing. Nevertheless, though, it is a good time, even though it's in the future, to have a look at what it should do for us, what its impact must be for it to be of any use. So let's talk about that standard then, and get and get away from the build a cat version. Sunnier climbs. Travel, skiing holiday, where would you like to be? Well, 56,007 should be able to bring us some places. What should it do for us? What should it do for our profession, for innovators? Well, it will, it will visualize idea management. It will provide a really clear scope of what idea management is and is not. It will give us a common ground that we can use to create products, to engage with our clients, to work with our employers, uh, it will be a platform for uh, innovation management systems for people who take that approach. It will be part of our profession's body of knowledge. And of course, that's part of the, the, the purpose, the mission, if you like, of Innovate Island is that we, we want to share good, good content, share best practice, and our profession has and is developing a body of knowledge so we can stay abreast of that in this network. Sounds fantastic. Prove it to me. 
this diagram, I did not get permission from the author, but luckily that author is in the room. Charlie, is it OK if I share this picture with people in our network? Well, you're going to put me in a very embarrassing position if I say no, aren't you? So <laughs> work away. <laughs> so this is an example of how not just Charlie, but the Irish experts on the National Standards Committee working on these standards is contributing. This diagram, with one, one little exception, is going into the ISO handbook, which has been approved for publication and should be with us within the next few months. But as, par as part of the conversation Charlie and I had, uh, I was looking for contributions, help from my colleagues in Ireland to give me a fresh pair of eyes on the standard that I've been working on, you know, in detail. And Charlie said, well, you know, if we just put a green box around these, that's what the standard is. So there are three hexagons. Identify the opportunities for innovation. Create concepts and then validate those concepts and the hypothesis the scope the intention for ISO 56007 is it's going to help us advise us innovation professionals and our clients and academia and others on why we would do these things what it means to do them and how to do them and that anything outside that box won't be in the standard and at least on a formal level, we can say idea management starts with identifying opportunities and ideas, creating concepts from those ideas and validating those concepts so we can decide go, no go, spike it, leave it alone, refine it or shelve it. And then we've got something, let's call it a proposition, which we can hand over to be developed and deployed where we're getting more into the world of project management. And if we can recall last week's session with Brian, he talked about starting with design thinking, moving on to lean startup, and then moving on to uh, agile. And this diagram effectively shows the same ground. So the idea management is definitely the design thinking, and, and we're just starting to get into the lean startup aspect of it. And then you hand over to people who are going to manage the project from there. Okay. This is a picture I'm very familiar with. I like it. It's clear to me. That's fascinating, but that doesn't tell us that it will serve the world of innovation professionals well. So I'd really love to hear the feedback from today's group on this diagram. Okay. So that's one way it will impact for us. It will show a clear scope of what idea management is. For those involved in innovation management or systems, it will show a clear distinction between idea management and innovation management, which is a much bigger, broader thing. <clears throat> Owen, sorry to interrupt you. There's a hand up there. Are you OK to, to take a question uh, from Fiona at this stage? Yes, go for it, Fiona. Thanks very much, Owen. And I don't mean to interrupt your flow. If you'd rather, I can save it till later. Well, I think the question is good and I might come back in detail, but let's put the question up there for a start. OK, so um, I'm really interested in how you've boxed it off in terms of idea management as part of innovation management. Um, and some of the work I've been doing myself in ISO, and it's specifically related to blockchain and DLT, has been to develop a uh, novel use case methodology, which we started off um, in typical fashion, collecting use cases, that kind of thing. But we really adopted an open innovation approach that would we kind of looked outwards to how uh, not only technical implementation was relevant, but how the business context was relevant also, specifically because it's blockchain and can have can can represent a business model in itself as as an application. Um, so we devised this methodology and tested it, and there's been a great degree of interest in it uh, across a number of different SDOs, particularly looking at blockchain and DLT and what we can learn and how we can share information across research and business. So new product development, new services, startups, new routes to market, and sometimes testing policy. There's a couple of use cases that were described from European Commission, which are completely hypothetical lab use cases, but they iterate on um, things like GDPR solutions for, for um, 
uh, data subject representation in blockchain, that kind of thing. But I will be, I'm really interested in, is there an opportunity for me maybe to show you this use case methodology and to uh, maybe simplify it somewhat as a useful tool, as a kind of systems or network view? Because this it's actually a really, from my point of view, right? As somebody, I have my own company, I'm a technologist. This is the way we think about, uh, and it's very much a lean kind of canvas approach. Who are your stakeholders? What do they do in the system? What is the data related to them in the system and how does it flow? So it's a handy mapping of potential um, ideas that in fact, if you use the on-chain, off-chain data flow analysis, or if we simplify it to any kind of system analysis, it's something that as a tool set can be handed off to a project manager. Yeah, so very sensible. And that's the point of uh, events like today, where, where hopefully we, well, we don't have the time, but where we can't get into too much detail, but we are saying, listen, we're a network, let's share. So Fiona, we talked recently, you and I, and we'll come back to that topic offline, you and I, but the, the short answer is yes. Thanks very much. Uh, I, okay. I, I think this um, boxed off diagram is really simple and clear, by the way, just to answer the question that you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Fiona. Well done, Charlie. Okay. No problem. Okay, so let's consider some of the other impacts that the standard has. We don't need to talk through all of these. The point is, I will make a declaration or a claim today, and we've got two years to see if this comes true. This standard is going to help us, our profession, our network. It's going to be a base and a platform for us. It's got to be focused on people and outcomes, then process, not on the technology. Although, of course, the technology is, is a crucial uh, enabler. That's um, aspirational. It will provide a framework for all those cases we discussed earlier. And that's what ISO has told us to do. So it, it must do that. It, we will advise, the standard will advise how to exploit insights, manage uncertainty, stay adaptable. Those are the principles. They're an extract from the eight principles of innovation management that are used globally and they're in the, the parent standards, 56,000 and 56,002. I won't say read them now uh, because it's Friday, but these things are useful and they do sit together and they are a whole lot shorter than many business books. Easier to read too. This standard will set a common global language. We will, we will end up closer to each other's definitions of key terms, idea, concept, opportunity. And I'll come back to that just at the end of the, of the slides. And it absolutely will bring uncertainty to the fore. That's gonna be a real value, I, I promise. But today we mightn't get to see too deep into that. Maybe we'll come back to that another day. Not a toolkit, because the moment we put out a toolkit, it'll be dated, and there are hundreds of toolkits. Uh, Charlie and I and some others attended a session recently where someone was uh, advertising and rec recommending a set of 555 tools and methods. And I'm sure when you look, there's more than that. But what we can do is think about that uncertainty and risk. Why is that so important for idea management? Well, this brings us back to the George Day slide with the failure rates for ideas. Are we each in this room today? Are we absolutely sure that we know what uncertainty is and what risk is? Are we absolutely sure that we can separate them well? Are you clear in your mind which of these pictures relates to which of those definitions? Are you clear in your mind when it's uncertainty and when it's risk? And can we be clear with our clients and with our employers and with the initiatives that we're looking at, where uncertainty comes into play and where risk comes into play. And that comes back to probabilistic thinking. I think if you're looking at references, um, there are plenty of them. I think the, the book, The Signal and the Noise is really useful. I think there's another book, Super Forecasters, which is really, really useful for that idea. But the definitions are in the standards and 56,007 will really bring this to the fore in our profession and help us to crystallize it. It will do that for us. Uh, for your information, we're near the end of the slides now, but uh, after the slides that we're going to talk to, uh, I'll provide some links to some of the things we've mentioned and, uh, and I'll provide the definitions of these two terms for anybody sad enough to stay with the slides that long. 
Okay, we do need to talk about measurement. But the standard that I'm working on is not about measurement. But measurement is definitely important for ideas. So I've done quite a bit of work on this, and I'm also actually working on that standard, the innovation management measurement standard. But I had a conversation recently with John Says, who's an ex NASA chief technical officer. And he said, and I'm not quite quoting, but it was close. He said, sure, nice idea. Watch out. Don't do it too early. You'll mess everything up. Pick a couple, run with them, learn from them, crawl, walk, run. Same thing we say about general idea management. Then if we look at the standard itself, what it says is follow the process. Be disciplined, be honest, and put your claims, your hypothesis, your ideas, your, your guesses, put them out front where everybody can see them. Then you validate. And if you do that, then completing your validated learning cycle is the phrase that Lean Startup uses. If you complete your cycle, you'll learn. You'll reduce uncertainty. You will enable decisions for go, no go. And that process will reveal where are the winners and where are the others that don't deserve or can't have your attention and resources at this point in time. So that's the most essential measure, according to John Says. Uh, and that's the perspective that the people doing the 56,007 standard are taking. So we're done with me talking at you. You're very good. And as far as I know, most of you are still awake. So medals will be minted and cups of tea will be ready in a couple of minutes. And we do have a few minutes for discussion. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Owen. Um, we've got a couple of hands up, uh, which I'll come to in, in just a second. Uh, a very quick question, well, maybe not a quick answer, but quick question from me. Uh, the second example, you had 500 ideas or 1500 ideas. Um, you know, how did you actually manage that volume of ideas? Were they thrown in and kind of as formed concepts? Or did you have to manage discussion, debate, um, evolution of those ideas? How did you do that? Um, everybody in the organization was invited to a workshop. The workshops ran for over the first two weeks of the month long period. Everybody at the workshop did a pretty standard design thinking brainstorming process. You do it yourself silently. You, you talk about it with somebody else. You put them together. Then you rank and you cluster. And then we fed that in during the session with re re people at each table uh, typing those uh, ideas into a, 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 a database system, an ideation platform. That worked very, very well. The, the platform reduced the amount of work, reduced the barriers, made sure that all ideators knew, well, everybody knew where the ideas came from, and every ideator knew the status of their idea at every stage. Uh, and are also involved a little bit of uh, clever stuff with AI, where there's, there's suggested clusters uh, and and other uh, angles that you could take to help your own analysis and synthesis. That worked really, really well. What really, really worked though, more than tech was, we had ambassadors and champions at senior and middle, and let's call it the supervisor level. And we at the, every Monday got them to go out and go and meet the people who were going to be asked to produce the ideas. And after they produced the ideas to say, what did you think of that? Which ones are most relevant? And it was the walking and talking that got the 1300 builds. OK, thank you. I, I, I mean, I, from my experience, I, I think that if people are looking for idea management, it's, it's probably one of the areas where there is more technology available than any other aspects. Um, if you look for innovation management systems, generally they're managing these three steps of ideation, which is three steps out of five within one area out of seven within the standard. So it's very, very kind of focused, but it's probably got more tech support than anything else. So, Brian, you you had your hand up. Um, yeah, thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Owen. That was very good, very thought provoking, and uh, and it was a nod to you as well, Charlie. I definitely agree with that scope of uh, ideation or idea management within the ISO standard. I think that's nice and simple and nice and perfect. Um, Owen, my question relates actually to the first example, and and it sort of, it sort of stuck with me, and it's been bugging me since I heard it. So it was like. You, you ended that example by saying it was a failure and I was trying to understand mm. why did you say it was a failure because to me 
that that sounded like success. It was a failure for the sales director, but you know, but for everyone else, it seems here's an additional, you know, additional source of income. I was just interested in why you you, you said it was a failure. Partly to get someone like you to say something like that, Brian. <laughs> um, that's well, been, I fell for it. Yeah, no, no, I'm being silly. So which I do. Um, I deliberately called it a failure because there are perspectives from which it was a failure. It was a commercial success, but the finance director who became the CEO of the organization a year later hated it because it didn't uh, fulfill the model of you get your money back, payback. Not quite a return on investment simplified rule, but you didn't get your payback within two years. It took three years to get the money back. And because the organization was inefficient in other aspects, they didn't organize themselves to install these things cheaply and quickly. Therefore, it was a disruption and there were opportunity costs at the operations level for introducing this new product. Okay. But it, uh, us who now know innovation know that that's worthwhile. And 15 years later, I would know how to prevent that being an issue beforehand by stating up front, this is what we're going to see. Don't expect this, mm -hmm. that. And you could set out your criteria, avoiding the net present value calculation, but still being able to look at the future value of what you're doing. Uh, the sales manager got fired because he was in, he was involved in something that increased sales but disrupted other teams. And the finance director never uh, came over to my side and hated me for, and I'm using the word, over, I'm, I'm over egging the pudding because he doesn't hate me and I don't hate him, but he hated me for having represented that argument for two years. And as far as he was concerned, it was dead as an argument after three months. So the team that did it, fell apart. The project wasn't followed up. Other projects like it were not done. But the successes that were available from it, nobody went for it. So it demonstrates okay. the importance of leadership and it, you know, it really has to be come from the very top of the organization and also the, the business model impact, obviously, that, that had the operational impact rather than the impact in the revenue stream. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And, and stakeholder time. management. Yeah. Business model is a key one too. Stakeholder yeah. management was absolutely crucial or would have been. Okay, stuff. All right, thanks for that, Owen and Brian. Uh, Shane. Yeah, thanks, Owen. That was that was all really very interesting. I guess the main question I have, and in some ways, I'd argue that this is the thing you've spent the most time talking about, but it's the one thing that's not represented in the diagram, and it's the process of filtering. And when you talk about um, risk tolerance. So I would argue that the three stories you told are three organizations with different cultures and the prime difference in those cultures is their risk tolerance. And when you look at that process of identify, ideate and validate, uh, I'd argue that at least once there's a powerful filtering going on in there and, the, and the, perhaps that should be acknowledged. So you identify, you ideate, you filter and then you validate. And, and the biggest driver of that filter, I'd argue, is culture and risk tolerance. But I just wonder what, you, what, what your thoughts on that are, because that's what you've talked about a lot, is stakeholder management, engagement with groups of people, how things get taken from a lot of ideas to a small number of ideas. But it's not explicitly called out in the in the process you, you've you've laid. And I'm, and I'm not speaking to the parts of the standard today because it's a short session. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm sharing with everybody that something is out there and making a claim that it's going to be increasingly valuable to us and we should stick with that news item as a, as a, as a network. Uh, and I have a couple of aspects of it. So if that diagram will become, let's call it figure one. Sure. And figure one will show how the standard relates to the other standards in the family. And then figure two, three, four are every bit as important because we must visualize this for people or the standard will not work. It'll be too hard. For people to engage with. So we've got to visualize the uncertainty, whether it's horizons or, or whatever the mechanism we use, and we've got to visualize the process. So if we look at the slide I had a couple of minutes ago, I won't put it back up, but I said there are three questions that I would like to ask. No, I'm not looking for today because we don't have time, but idea and opportunity, what do they mean? What's the distinction? What order are they in our heads? How should we deal with that in the standard? I think that's really important. Do we all understand the same thing by idea and opportunity? What about insight? What about area of opportunity? Another question is, what about that, that progression of identify, create, validate? Does that hang together or does that confuse the matter? There are a lot of experts who don't like the label validate. And another question is, the people in the team developing the standard, 
had to go into design thinking. We, we have to stay above the branded approach. So we're looking at perhaps espousing, explore, experiment, exploit. And we don't get to answer that today, but I think it's a fascinating question for us in our network. Does that work? Where would the holes in it be? I couldn't find a non-proprietary representation of it today, so I didn't put a slide up. But I think that's a really, really valuable question for us as professionals. What's the progression? What's the best way of thinking about it? Brian's slide last week touched on it, but I quite like the words, and I wonder whether it would work. OK. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. Can I can I just quickly, there's no other hands up, so quickly go back to that, the example that Brian picked up on as well. And you, you said about the, you know, the, the, the sales director got fired because it, it caused too much disruption. Um, I mean, there's that kind of new product, existing products, new products, existing markets, um, uh, new markets. There's so many organizations that I kind of would work with or deal with who don't set up expectations up front. You know, so so when they, they say they want to be radical, they want to be disruptive, and then ideas come in that are radical or disruptive, and they can't cope with it, um, because what they really want is to find new products for existing markets, or they want to tweak what they've got and make it a bit better. So, do you do you see lots of ideas failing purely because they're not what was expected? It may not be what's stated, but it's just really not what was expected because they didn't do that exercise up front. Absolutely. I was and, also, <laughs> and, and the team doing the work were new to innovation as an approach and didn't know how to how to head off those issues. And that, that was that was me, you know, when I was knee high to a grasshopper. OK, so the importance of strategy up front and getting that and get, getting the, the stall set out so people know what to expect. OK, thank you. Uh, David, David, you have your hand up. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Oh, and, um, I'm interested because I've, I've been talking to a couple of people in Enterprise Ireland about this recently and the, the story you described there, I can I can relate to it in terms of my, my 20 years in industry, absolutely, but it brings up that inter interesting interface between the idea management and then the, the solution deployment piece and then where product management fits into all that, right? Because the piece that you described to me is a, is a product management issue, which which sometimes isn't the realm of innovation, innovation interfaces with it. But there's, if it's functioning properly, there should be multiple voices from multiple areas of the organization involved in it. So was the failing there in the idea management? Was it in the solution delivery processes or was it was it in the product management approach? The results. So the problematic results became apparent gradually and uh, only after implementation during deployment. But I'm confident with the benefit of hindsight and experience that we could have addressed that issue ahead of time in terms of strategizing and expectation and what was the ramp from idea to, uh, de to deployment and value realization and when people should start to see profitability and cash and when should it be less of a, a, a an opportunity cost for the operations part of the business? We we knew that they would be difficult. We didn't ex anticipate how difficult it would be to deal with them, and we left them till another day rather than heading them off at the pass. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, we, we've no other hands up. Um, so, and it is almost 10 to 2, so we can maybe almost keep the promise of finishing around quarter to 10 to. Um, so I, I think, I mean, it, there's so much in this, in this area that it might be a, a good candidate for having spin out conversations. Um, so I, if there's any aspect of it, because we do this at a Friday lunchtime, we've said for ages, if people want to meet up on a, in an evening or some morning and have a follow on chat, kind of just a group, smaller group of people, then you know I think it was a good candidate to do that. So if there are any particular topics that or aspects of this that people would like to discuss further, then then maybe come back to Owen and myself, um, and we'll try and get one of those follow up calls arranged uh, over the next week or two. Um, so thank you, Owen. Thanks so much for um, for. I'm sorry, I'm sharing something at the same time here. Uh, can't multitask. So. Uh, Thank you, Owen, for, for, for taking the time. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your contributions and questions. Uh, next week on the 16th, um, I'm delighted to confirm that we've got Claire Dillon and Denise Cooper speaking. 
there are two global authorities, uh, and I'm not kind of overstating that, um, on the use of open source models for innovation. A lot of you know, will know Claire, um, maybe fewer of you would know Denise. Um, we're really fortunate to secure time with them. Um, they've actually got a five hour webinar going on after they speak to us next week. Uh, so we're going to try and start at one o'clock sharp rather than giving sort of the extra five minutes so we can get as much time from them uh, as, as we can. Um, for those of you on the call today if, who are new to Innovate Ireland, um, take a look at the website. Uh, don't forget you can access all of the events that are coming up in the calendar that you can access through that website. So make your way to innovateisland.net to find out more and to access that calendar. Um, thanks everybody for coming along today and as ever some great points some great questions. Uh, come back to us with any ideas for follow-up discussions if you'd like to have them. And um, thank you so much, Owen, for, for leading that today. Um, I really enjoyed it, uh, really valuable. Hope everybody found it useful and all being well, we'll see you same time next week. Have a great thanks. weekend. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, so. thanks, 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 see you, everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Bye. Bye.